Today we have, uh, I would say, the guest of special honor, <laughs> a man who, uh, together with him, uh, I started my um, diplomatic career, mm -hmm. I remember. Yes. It was end of 95. Uh, that time was uh, really difficult, but at the same time fascinating, because many changes took, 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 uh, took place. And uh, I would say, uh, I can insist, insist that I can uh, even prove, I have many proof that the uh, role of our American uh, partners in uh, those changes and everything happening there, that time in Georgia, was just, uh, not just important or crucial, it was decisive. Now uh, we have the conversation with Ambassador of the United States to Georgia of that time, Mr. William Courtney. Dear Bill, uh, me and Valerie, uh, I remember you from from those times. Valerie has had a special special relationship because he's also a fan of tennis. Mm -hmm. I yes. remember you back yes. then. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it was never so good. Yeah, but anyway, it was. Uh, really, really uh, interesting time. Uh, you know, we uh, uh, talked uh, preliminary and um, uh, Mr. Gekeshitze also explained, mm -hmm. I uh, suppose to you, that this is the uh, project of the Georgian Foreign Policy Heritage Association mm -hmm. together with the uh, Rondelli Foundation, now GFSA is is renamed. It's, uh, it's called now this way. Uh, and we are interviewing all those who either uh, had taken part or at least witnessed changes and developments in Georgia. At this time, we are studying the uh, last uh, decade of the 20th century. And you are mm -hmm. really I was here. <laughs> the <laughs> the time. Yeah. who was in very, very much involved in this, in these developments. So uh, let me welcome you on behalf of all, all uh, your host organizations, and uh, express hope that our conversation will will be interesting and helpful for the for the further generations also. Valerie will uh, lead the interview, uh, allow me to, to intervene. Sure. Time to time. So let's try okay. to do this job together. Good. Super. Mr. Ambassador, again, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for you to agree to give us sure. this interview. It's very important it's, it's to us. An honor. You arrived to Georgia um, in September 1995, if my memory uh, is That's so correct. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, how did you find Georgia then? What were your first impressions? I came after three and a half years in Kazakhstan, where I had served um, before coming. So at first my comparisons were with Kazakhstan. I remember one of my impressions was um, there were a lot of men standing in the streets in Tbilisi. And we didn't have that in Kazakhstan. And I thought there might, you know, was this because of unemployment or, or, or what was it? At first I thought maybe it was, it was kind of threat. I remember the first time I went jogging, I went over the, the, the park and I asked our embassy security people, should I have somebody there A company. for security? Yes, because I'd never seen so many men just standing around idle, not doing anything before, and the security people assured me no problem. Um, the difference between Kazakhstan and Georgia, Georgia was already Western. Georgia had a lot of information about the West, a lot of Georgians were exposed one way or another. Uh, one reason was in the Soviet period, for foreigners who would come to Moscow and the Kremlin wanted to make positive impression, they would visit Moscow and then they would go either to Leningrad or Georgia. 
for different reasons. So Leningrad, Hermitage, uh, Kirov Ballet, things. And uh, others would come here. Uh, so Georgia had more exposure to outside people. One example, take Gorbachev and Shevardnadze. Gorbachev was in Stavropol, an area where there were a lot of nationalities, you should have understood, but there were not many foreigners who went there. Whereas Shevardnadze had, had quite a lot of experience with visiting foreigners uh, here. Uh, including, I remember, Ted Turner and Jane Fonda were among the more yeah. famous Americans who, was right. who came here. Um, so when Gorbachev asked Shevardnadze to be foreign minister, you know, Shevardnadze was stunned. But in fact, it was a wise decision, not only because Shevardnadze was very competent, but he had more exposure, personal exposure to Westerners than any other member of the Politburo or the Candidati, the candidate yeah. members of the Politburo. He had more. And uh, it showed. You know, he was able to become effective foreign minister fairly quickly. In the Soviet period, Georgia was able to, to maintain a civil society, uh, family-based, sometimes criminal-based, but a degree of separation from official structures that was not possible in most other areas of, of Soviet Union. So in, in uh, Kazakhstan, for example, much of Kazakhstan was a military test branch. Very few foreigners there. So they were thrilled when Americans came, opened up embassy, they were thrilled that foreigners were coming. But they had no experience. And Georgia had a lot of experience already and a lot of understanding uh, of the West. Georgia was the most westernized part of the brief I use, except for the Baltics uh, area. Um, so that was pleasant surprise. So actually when you arrived, you, uh, you registered this potential of Georgia for development as soon as it was already Western, uh, Western oriented. Uh, for development uh, in the sense of political development and economic potential. Kazakhstan had a huge amount of energy. And so in Kazakhstan, at uh, Tengiz, uh, in the western Kazakhstan, yeah. uh, the first huge U.S. investment anywhere in the former Soviet Union uh, was Chevron carried out. Yeah, yeah. It is still the best and largest project and anywhere in the, in the former Soviet space. Uh, here, there was no potential for investment on that scale. Here the issue was uh, doing something uh, uh, <clears throat> on a smaller scale, but taking advantage of Georgia's natural potential. And this was frustrating. Georgia has one of the terms of agriculture, one of the richest potentials anywhere in the world per hectare in terms of high value agriculture. But there was so much criminality uh, involved uh, and still today Georgians cannot buy, sell, collateralize uh, land freely and banks cannot foreclose on property. So having an efficient land market was one of our first goals here to promote a land cadaster so at least people understood what they're doing. Um, and we, wanted, we were hoping that Georgia would develop an efficient land market. In the first half of America's development, it was efficient market for agriculture land and clear property rights for minerals that enable America to become a wealthy country. Um, so we were hoping that that would happen. That got off to a slow start, um, and we're not you know, we were, we're not able to make as much progress there as as we had hoped. Um, but Georgia still has enormous potential for that. Right. I remember uh, how active American part, including embassy, of course, was and pushing for the active land reforms here, mm -hmm. especially related with the land cadaster and uh, 
uh, providing the privatization papers to mm -hmm. people and so on to persuade them to, 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 to use it effectively. Mm -hmm. I remember those discussions, sometimes very even heated, <laughs> but I would say it was very important. And I think, uh, I don't know, would you agree or not, but I hope you would, uh, that uh, Americans' role in promotion, in promoting those changes to uh, place exactly those years was important. 1995, if you remember, of course you, uh, you remember it, was the time when uh, many projects started with support of American side, uh, finalized. The financial system was reformed. Larry was mm -hmm. in you remember. Yeah. Larry was very successful yeah. in introduction. Absolutely. And that, that's, that was a, a huge achievement because it's not so easy for a small country to introduce uh, its own currency and have it be accepted uh, well. And so it worked well here. Yeah, it was with uh, great support, very active support of uh, Americans, Europeans also, so and the World Bank and uh, International Bank. That's correct. So mm -hmm. it's useful to think of all four together, European Union, World Bank, IMF, and the yeah. United States together, because we coordinated much uh, of the activities. Now one of the, one of the things that was apparent at the very beginning <coughs> was that Europe was going to be much more important for Georgia than America was. Uh, America had two strengths, were able to project military power at long distances, and we have huge energy companies. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, everything else is going to be more important for Europe. So in those times, remember Dennis Corboy, yeah. uh, who I still see often, uh, you know, we were looking to Georgia harmonizing its laws with European Union to become as, as close to European Union as possible because European Union will be a natural market for Georgia's products and for tourists coming here as well. Of course, Middle East uh, also. Uh, so the, the Europeanization of Georgia was something that we were very supportive yes. of. Yes, I agree and I remember how active the United States was uh, uh, Promoting Georgia's membership into the Council of Europe, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. supporting through their you know, personal, I'd say, uh, bilateral contacts with the member states and Europeans and so on and so on. Uh, so uh, I agree fully. It was a sort of cooperation between Westerners. By the way, here I think we have to mention Turkey also. Mm -hmm. It played a really great role, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, I wouldn't uh, use the word supervision, but it was under the guidance of the United States and the Europeans. Mm -hmm. uh, Turkey was not only a big neighbor and a powerful neighbor, but a representative of the Western world in this mm -hmm. part at that well, time, at yes, least. Yes, times have changed a bit. Yeah. yeah. So the, the early in the early years, the Baltic states had the Scandinavians to help lift them up, the Germans to help work with them to bring them in. Poland was close by. And Poland made shock therapy economic reforms mm -hmm. more so than the other East European countries. So Poland started moving out quickly. And Poland saw the Baltics as countries they should they should help. That was a positive thing. So for the Baltics it was almost ideal situation. Baltic Sea was an area in which um, uh, the West you know, had uh, military capacity and so it was not a, a major risk. Down here, quite different. Georgia was as European as Baltic states in orientation and, and mentality and desire. But in Black Sea, you know, Russia had military predominance in Black Sea. Turkey was having its own problems, not 
really sure whether it was going to go to Europe or Middle East, and that was still an issue. So Georgia's natural circumstances, geo geographically, if you will, were just more challenging. Uh, the Baltics made faster economic reforms uh, than uh, Georgia did because of that, that help and because the Baltics knew they were going to be part of Europe and knew they had to make yeah. some difficult decisions. Here, <clears throat> criminality uh, was a greater issue. The reforms ended up starting, starting slower, uh, if you will. Uh, but it was apparent at the very beginning <clears throat> that Georgia was going to be part of Europe. The Europeans at the time <clears throat> were not so sure about Georgia and Ukraine. It wasn't clear, you know, some Europeans at the time thought of Ukraine as a Christianized version of Turkey. That is a large country, very close to Europe, but not really European. Today, as, as we see now with Russian aggression uh, uh, in Ukraine and the response, Europeans see uh, Ukraine is very much a European, completely a European country. And they see Georgia as completely European. Now, there's no longer any doubt about, about that. The main challenge is still meeting the standards to join European Union and, and NATO. Uh, but Georgia and Ukraine together have really accomplished a lot over the last 25 years in helping Europe to understand uh, that Europe does not stop at the Warsaw Pact yeah. uh, border. Nine to five was also sorry, already, <laughs> but I'm uh, taking leading. No, no. Uh, I just uh, want to um, throw into uh, another issue. Ninety five was uh, the year when uh, the first, based on new constitution, mm -hmm. which was, by the way, worked out with the mm -hmm. United States very active support. Uh, the first uh, uh, election, mm -hmm. new parliament was introduced, mm -hmm. October president and new government, so everything was renewed. It mm -hmm. was sort of year of uh, uh, radical, radical institutional changes, mm -hmm. along with problems. You mm -hmm. are absolutely right, uh, having uh, the gangs still in many, many places here, mm -hmm. criminality and so on. But those changes uh, really, really laid uh, down the foundation for the further, further, further uh, reforms and uh, so on. And um, uh, young generation of politicians also, uh, let's say, been introduced uh, to the to the public and to the world. So it was fortunate for Shevardnadze and also for the Green Party that the Green Party allied with Shevardnadze in those elections in October 95. So Zurab Shvania became chairman of parliament, Misha became chair of the Judiciary Committee, Reza Adamia, Defense yeah. Committee. It was really a very strong team of, of Georgian leaders coming up uh, at the time. Even then, we, we thought Misha would be president someday because he had the charisma that political leaders sometimes had. But Zurabhshvania was a wise, uh, thoughtful uh, mentor for Misha and, and uh, Zurab himself, because of his family background, didn't expect to, to be president. Uh, but he was one of the really gifted leaders that Absolutely. Georgia had. Uh, in the in the early days, so those were those reforms. That was really the high point. My predecessor, Kent Brown, w was the real hero among diplomats because he came here at the time when the warlords were still fighting with each other, when gun battles took place in the atrium of the Mateki Hotel. Um, very different. By the time I got here, Shevardnadze had neutralized one world war after yeah. another. And so it was quite safe. In Kazakhstan, I did not have an armored car. I came here, suddenly I had armored car because the situation had been much riskier before. But when you consider 
the growing from Gaps to Hurtia, Civil War, by 1995, Georgia was developing as a democracy quite quickly. That was a remarkable achievement. And I think it was only possible because Georgia had preserved a lot of civil society and family structure during the Soviet period. And most other parts of the Soviet Union just did not have that strength, actually. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, sev several times we have mentioned Russia in our mm -hmm. conversation. It's natural because Russian factor was very important both in the region and uh, Russians were playing very active role also trying to influence Georgia's mm -hmm. orientation, whatever. Uh, what, what do you recall in this respect? Uh, how do you assess the role of Russia in the period of your stay here? What, what, what were they doing? Well, when we look back at, at what the West tried to do in Russia, the um, biggest mistake we made was we did not press Yeltsin to reform the Siloviki, the security service, yeah. special security service in, in the military. Yeah. So when you look at other institutions in Russia, every other institution had some major reform except the Siloviki. We are now living with the consequences of a lack of reform of the Siloviki in Russia. I saw Shevardnadze, I would say about every eight or nine days. Mm -hmm. He, um, and we would talk about Georgia issues for maybe one quarter of time, but we spent three quarters of time talking about Russia. Shevardnadze provided us a window into what was going on in the Kremlin and Russia in general that, that we did not have other places. Our ambassador in Moscow could not see Yeltsin frequently, for example. There were no other places which had leaders who were as accessible as Shevardnadze. So Heydar Aliyev, Nazarbayev, you know, they all were quite knowledgeable, and I used to discuss these matters with Nazarbayev a lot. Shevardnadze had much deeper insights uh, into, uh, he, he talked with Yeltsin personally uh, uh, at times. Uh, so this is actually for Washington. This is a valuable opportunity to try to understand because the 1990s were kind of chaotic in Russia. Um, you know, as we saw, for example, we were trying to understand the dynamics of, of what led Yeltsin to go into Chechnya in 1994, for example, because Yeltsin jeopardized a lot of the reforms, a lot of the goals he was trying to achieve by going into Chechnya. So the opportunity to talk with President Shevardnadze in depth about this was one of the special pleasures, actually, of, of being here at the time. And he, he was such a wise uh, and insightful uh, person. I remember going to Moscow, visiting Konstantin Zatulin. He was the chair of the uh, SNG Committee of yeah. the Duma. He was the one of the most so nationalist revanchist uh, people to to talk with him to see you know, what were their goals and I you know, came away shocked uh, I mean now we're accustomed to seeing what Alexander Dugan and these other people said but uh, the imperial mindset in Russia about Georgia and other places was a main, it was a huge obstacle to being able to develop cooperation between. And, and one of our goals was to was to encourage cooperation between the non-Russian republics and Russia because we wanted you know, stable, we wanted everybody to be able to develop in a prosperous uh, sort of way. But yet, what we saw with Abkhazia and uh, Tsimbali uh, <coughs> and Transnistria was where the Siloviki were moving, and Yeltsin couldn't stop them. Uh, Yeltsin also had some imperial instincts, so he would go back and forth in his mind, and Chevardnadze gave us a lot of insight about that. Uh, 
but he he lacked control uh, over the Silovic. And so one of our biggest concerns was that there would be some eruption either through the Chechen war or through Siloviki and Moscow who would want to take all of Georgia, seize everything here. A key issue in those days was the export of Caspian oil to world markets. Uh, as you know, U.S. policy was to, uh, to have more routes to market, Diversified. multiple yeah. diversified. Uh, U.S. policy since World War II had been more sources of global supply of energy, the better, and the more routes to market, the better. Sure. So when the Chevron project got started, the big issue was the Caspian Pipeline Consortium, Kateka, uh, mm -hmm. negotiating that. And uh, Chevronic, the oil and gas minister, is proposing a corrupt mechanism which would keep Chevron from earning any money, really. It would be just Russia would be able to take everything it wanted. And uh, President Clinton and uh, Vice President Gore would engage with Yeltsin and Chairman of Merit and others. But nothing happened until in the spring of 1996 when Azerbaijan and Georgia agreed on the early oil pipeline. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I mean, that was the first pipeline that would export energy to the global markets without going through Russia. And all of a sudden the Russians realized that you know, this was a reality. This Something happen. is happening. <laughs> <Yes>. so, <laughs> so then they suddenly retreated on the Caspian Pipeline Consortium. And that was a major U.S. interest because of the Chevron investment. They retreated and Chevron was able to negotiate a financially viable arrangement which persists to this day. And, and still works well. So Georgia and Azerbaijan played a, a key role. At the beginning, in the early 1990s, we didn't even think about that because Georgia was just in chaos with civil yeah. war. So it was when Georgia was able to stabilize itself and then suddenly this changed the dynamics entirely for Caspian oil uh, development. Uh, and that was a major, uh, that was of great importance to the West Time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Bill, uh, one of the main you have already, uh, you started also already talking on that. Um, uh, our main goal is to to, uh, to analyze how the U.S. Georgia relationship, uh, bilateral, was uh, started developing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would recall a very important uh, event of, of that period. It was the introduction of uh, or launching of um, uh, U.S. Georgian security dialogue mm -hmm. and setting the commission with two co-chairs and so on. Mm -hmm. And very ma and many important projects. Mm -hmm. One of them was the border guard service, which mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. Uh, developed uh, with the American support from the very sketch. Because we, had, uh, we had nothing, mm -hmm. just to general, <laughs> just general trades, uh, mm -hmm. and that was all. Mm -hmm. uh, could you could, could you recollect, make some recollections about that? Well, we were concerned that the persistence of uh, Soviet institutions after the Soviet collapse. So here, the Transcaucasian military district, the Russians and four military bases yeah. here. Uh, we had this challenge. And the border in with Turkey also. Border with Turkey. We had this challenge in Kazakhstan, too, whereas the Russians really wanted to retain control of the borders of all of the former Soviet republics. Uh, that was, they saw that as a important imperial step. And again, because of the lack of reform of the Siloviki in Moscow, you know, this is an imperial goal. So we worked with Georgia. We, through high-level meetings in uh, Clinton, Gore, and others, uh, tried to encourage Yeltsin to move away from, from this kind of uh, activity. 
Uh, it was a slow process. Georgia didn't want to create a crisis with with Russia, but so slowly kept pushing yeah. on it. And so Georgia actually was, Georgia's approach was very successful at, and, and prudent and wise in, in how that uh, proceeded. Uh, particularly when we compare that with Misha, when Misha was constantly taunting the Kremlin and things like that, which was not uh, helpful for the West. And we wanted Georgia to work the way Shevardnadze did with, with Russia. So that, that all worked. You gained control uh, of your borders. Um, the, Soviet, the former Soviet military bases yeah. were gradually you know, were able, except of course in Abkhazia and, and South Ossetia. So that was a real success of Georgian diplomacy, but also building up your own border service yeah. at the time. To, to and the Coast Guard border. also was also the Coast Guard created, I would say, from 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 zero. Mm -hmm. There yes. was nothing because Russians uh, even sunk or blow up everything mm -hmm. when they left mm -hmm. ports in Batumi, Poti, and Suhumi. Yes. Uh, back in 1992, 93, and everything was uh, has started with within the project launched uh, within the frame of this uh, security dialogue uh, led by uh, Ambassador B. Croft from mm -hmm. America. So I can remember that mm -hmm. yeah. it was uh, not just important job, but it was a really strategically important event for the entire region. We began bringing U.S. warships to Batumi for mm -hmm. visits, yes. uh, and th that also sent a big signal to uh, to Russians because Russians had ships in Sevastopol, which were not in very good condition, but they didn't have much naval power here in the eastern Mediterranean, the uh, eastern Black Sea, and so when we started seeing U.S. warships coming over here, that kind of surprised them, if you will, but it sent the right signal to Russia that Georgia was determined to, to be an independent country. Yes. Um, so this, uh, this um, uh, contribution of the United States to the development of Georgia is uh, of uh, big significance, of course, for and you have mentioned a number of projects, uh, Mr. Ambassador, including uh, land cadastering and now security dialogue. Uh, what what other what other projects can you can you recall that the uh, U.S. were developing uh, here in the time of your stay? Well, one of them, well, the way I met Iraq at first, was in the public health area. Mm -hmm. um, there was a humanitarian motive because when the Soviet Union collapsed, hospitals in the British Soyuz had no medicines. It was just, it was just empty uh, yeah. everywhere. I remember going in Kazakhstan to a hospital right after I got there in early 1992, and they had boxes of aspirin, but there was nothing inside but showing them on the, on the shelves. So we worked closely in the yeah. public health area. That was a high priority. But there was also, in addition to the humanitarian aspect, there was the concern about communicable diseases. Uh, one of the concerns was antibiotic resistant tuberculosis issues. So we felt it was important for the West to, to become more active uh, in, in Georgia, really, to, both for our own interests as well as for Georgia's humanitarian yeah. interests. Using the experience of our scientists. Yes. And then uh, Mr. Adamia then followed that and continued uh, mm -hmm. uh, working on that uh, issue. So it was a really uh, very important uh, start of cooperation. Now we have, uh, Valeria, you know, this huge laboratory in Tbilisi, which makes sometimes Russians nervous. I don't know why, yes. <laughs> but, anyway, but anyway, they are complaining. Uh, They're complaining uh, about everything. <laughs> this is a product of that beginning. Many, many things which we, uh, as we uh, uh, yeah, yeah, usually call it, 
harvested in 1999, you know, that was mm -hmm. very yeah. very productive year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Started these mm -hmm. in the 95, 96. Our cooperation with the European Union, 96, it was mm -hmm. the PCA signing mm -hmm. together with the Armenians and Azeris. Uh, our talks with the WTO, with mm -hmm. American mm -hmm. and European support. And uh, in 1999, it's ended with the accession of Georgia to the council. Georgia was the second post-Soviet country. So the post-Soviet countries are quite different. So one of the wisest things that European Union did with uh, partnership and cooperation agreements, and that NATO did with the Partnership for Peace, mm -hmm was to develop structures while on paper they looked the same for every country, but in fact they were flexible enough yes. so the countries that wanted to do more under those mm -hmm. could do more and become closer to European Union or get more involved. So Georgia was very much in our mind uh, in that respect that we knew Georgia was going to move quickly for Europe yeah, and, and NATO and take fuller advantage of those things. And so we, we wanted to have more flexible arrangements. In the defense relationship, I remember at the very beginning, uh, when Partnership for Peace got started and we began developing bilateral relationship, the U.S. military came out and said, well, we have to spend one year essentially doing English language instruction for Georgian military, or otherwise they can't interact with NATO and the United States. And I was thinking that, you know, there would be ships and planes and things like that at first. So no, no, we have to learn English. Uh, and so it was a, it was like Lego, you know, block by block. So the military started you know, learning English and then they would go to some of our schools in the United States and military schools and, you know, technical schools and acquisition of military equipment and uh, strategy and how to carry that out, our military colleges. Uh, so it was a very, it was a gradual process, yes, but it developed uh, the fundamental basis for a situation now in which Georgia, as you know, is the largest per capita contributor to Afghanistan, to NATO activities in Afghanistan. And so Georgia is really playing a much larger international security role than we expected at, at the time. But it's because Georgians really took this this seriously and develop the, the capacity to, to cooperate and because Georgia had a commitment to, to go westward. And that commitment, so if we compare Ukraine and Georgia, the Kremlin knew that the Baltics were lost when I was here. Kremlin knew they had lost the Baltics, that they were not ever. But here, they thought these are our Orthodox, you know, Pavlislav, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. brethren, you know, been together with Georgians for a long period of time, a lot of family ties, other things. They didn't expect to lose Georgia at when I was here. We did expect them to lose Georgia. And so there were more frictions, if you will. With Kazakhstan, Kremlin didn't expect to lose Kazakhstan, and Kazakhstan, you know, didn't try to pretend to be a Western country, although it quietly developed very strong relationships with the West, but didn't pretend to be a Western country. So it was here that the imperial vision of the Kremlin, and of many Russians, you know, it's here that the greatest friction, the greatest strain developed, because they, they didn't expect it here as fast as it happened. They thought that I mean, Ukraine was closer physically to the West. Ukraine had a far larger diaspora in the West than Georgia uh, did. So they saw Ukraine as a real testing ground, but they thought, as you know, Putin likes to say, that we're all one people with the Ukrainians, mm -hmm. we're not separate people. Uh, but they didn't expect things to move so quickly here. So everything that happened between what well, the Georgia did had more importance for the West and for the Kremlin than in almost other places. 
more so than the Baltics, more so than, than Kazakhstan, and more so than Ukraine. Only later did the Russians realize that Ukraine had more civil society than Russia did. Russia didn't know that at first, so they didn't see a threat. And of course later, you know, we've seen what's happened. So it was here, this was the test tube of, of Western, if you will, how, how the West was going to be attractive to a non-Russian republic. It was here that the, was the testing ground, uh, if you will. Very interesting point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, throw into one <laughs> conversation another, another, I think, very important point. It was back in 1995, 1996, when in May uh, the OSC conference was convened on the CFE adaptation. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember mm. as a minister I was getting information from our friends from uh, Americans also, uh, naturally. And one day uh, when we met, uh, it was mm, something uh, uh, unexpectedly. Uh, it was a case when my our guys from Vienna, uh, Giga, Levan, and so on, informed me more about the situa local situation there and in the, in the conference than embassy had the information. And with, when, when we started talking about that, uh, and I put forward some, some, some more data, uh, you said, welcome to diplomacy, I remember. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was a really, uh, really fascinating something because this was the uh, formal cooperation in Vienna we established uh, with the Americans, naturally, but Guam also was uh, launched uh, at that conference, mm -hmm. very, at mm -hmm. very conference. It was the conference where uh, uh, Guam countries uh, discovered that they have the similar problems, the similar challenges that united them. Mm -hmm. Could you continue this? We collect these recollections. So, <laughs> For Bill Perry, our yeah. Secretary of Defense at the time, um, dealing with Pavel Gratchev mm -hmm. uh, was the hardest part of his job. And I knew Perry before going to Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. and he uh, came to visit in Kazakhstan twice when I was there. Um, dealing with Gratchev was hard. So the first time that Perry and Gratchev worked out something on the flank issue for yeah. CFE. It was not good. Uh, I went to see Shevardnadze, and the only time in my two years of conversations with Shevardnadze, the only time he ever said anything critical of the United States was at that time. And he said, it would have been better if that deal had not been worked out. So I went back to Washington. I went he back prompted to another something. Yes. Embassy. And sent a telegram to senior people in Washington saying, uh, Shabernazi has never criticized our policy except this. We've got to take this seriously. And indeed, Perry backtracked mm -hmm. and yeah. had to to uh, work out a new arrangement, a better arrangement. Uh, and so it was Shevardnadze's, uh, I think, had impact, uh, particular impact, uh, because the respect for Shevardnadze in Washington was so high uh, that he was, he helped, he helped us do the right thing. Uh, uh, Great. Uh, and so, in, of course, in the end, it worked out, 1999, most high, high point and Istanbul. I I was there. Yeah, yeah. We're remember. all and now we look back fondly. Mm -hmm. CFE is, is no more. Uh, mm. uh, Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? It's just suspended. <laughs> it's suspended. Formally, formally, because uh, it, it was not abolished and uh, was not kicked out. 
but uh, of course uh, Russia, uh, Russians would, 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 would resist it, will resist it. Uh, Russia is somewhere. going to need a more democratic government mm. before we all need things like such as such changes happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, you, you mentioned here now a great point, yes? It was really because at that uh, conference uh, the process started which ended with the, the 1999 mm -hmm. uh, OSCE summit in, in, in Istanbul, yes. which allowed Georgia to free our land from, from presence. Yes. Uh, Russian military, which was, I would say, set here forcibly after the problems, after the tragedy of Abkhazia and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you made a very interesting point saying that if not changes were, which were introduced in Georgia in 1995, it would be impossible to sign early oil agreement mm -hmm. in 1996. Uh, so, uh, so the, the democratic development yeah, was, right. uh, was critical. Strengthening gold but the most important thing was that Georgia settled down. There was no more fighting. Mm -hmm. Because for oil companies, yeah, they think stability in means everything. Terms yeah. of 40 years or 50 years when they make investments. Mm -hmm. And so even though oil, oil pipeline was just a little thing, but in symbolically in the Kremlin, it was a big shock. Was they didn't believe that non-Russian republics would ever actually implement do it. such and such. Do it. It. Yeah. You know, the <coughs> main problem for Kremlin was that they didn't respect their neighbors. They didn't believe their neighbors were strong. You know, remember we used to talk about first thing we did in the West was talk about sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of Kremlin really never believed. Which actually you know, basic OSC principles. Yes, basic, sure. basic OSC principles. It was nothing new, it was just basic. Yeah. Basic. So as we were discussing with the border control, they wanted to maintain yep. border Absolutely. control and, and all that. So they, they just didn't really respect. And they also, did, they also didn't understand. Remember one of my most uh, poignant conversations with Chevronazi. At one point, I asked him, why did Gorbachev not understand the nationalities problems? He was in Stavropol. You know, if he had been in Omsk or something, you know, it was first secretary, then yeah. you know, maybe he wouldn't know, but he was in Stavropol. And Shevardnadze smiled and said, uh, Gorbachev was a good communist. Meaning that you know, a good communist thinks there really is no nationalities problem. That all the nationalities are happy you know, working together mm -hmm. with, 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 with the things. And, and he was right. I mean, that's, we understand better now Gorbachev's blind spots, uh, uh, if you will. Well, there was a blind spot not just of Gorbachev, but of Kremlin and you know, a lot and, of the political the entire system there. So, so, on the one hand, they knew Georgia was different, and they knew Georgia was a little uneasy, but they still didn't think Georgia would make a break and, and go west. Uh, and again, you know, so you were a bigger shock to them at the time than Ukraine was later. You know, mm -hmm. Later, because you know, Ukraine was divided, <coughs> but you shocked them first. The Baltics didn't shock them. They knew that they knew that they had lost, but you shocked the system in, in Kremlin, and that's why, in many respects, you know, they were so. You know, I think the assassination attempts against Chevronazi mm -hmm. were in part driven by Kremlin frustration that Georgia was moving away mm -hmm. from the you know, wanting to be part of Russia controlled sphere of influence is in color. Now, so again, this was the testing ground. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, um, anything else? No, no, we have huge 
<laughs> but uh, you have some time. Oh, I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay until 10 o'clock uh -huh. when we go to airport. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I have time. So. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, some, 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 some something about the uh, about our cooperation uh, in the field of uh, economic development uh, and uh, uh, attraction of business and so on. It uh, did not uh, went that well. We hoped, but uh, to my mind. If I remember correctly, the first uh, large uh, electricity company went in at your time. No, no. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Oh, no. Is I think it was, was late. It was late. Yeah, it was late. late. <coughs> Some late. It was 96 uh, or 97. Or yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, it was just af after I was here. So the, the, the negotiations, I remember, were 98, 99. Even so? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Because uh, Michel Weber was Minister of Privatization, yeah. I was Deputy Foreign Minister where I came from Ukraine in 98. And I remember oh, I visiting see, Misha, he was, he was in a very hard uh, negotiating process with mm -hmm. IAS uh, to, mm -hmm. to, to take control over this uh, electricity distribution mm -hmm. system. But so it started maybe earlier. Well, yeah. during my time, uh, Frontera started yeah. coming. So Bill White had been Deputy Secretary of Energy uh -huh. in the first Clinton administration. He's from Houston. He's a yeah. prominent lawyer in Houston. So he formed or became involved with a company called Frontier. And so they came to, to uh, Tbilisi, came to see us, and they wanted to explore for oil and gas. Well, I had been in Kazakhstan where we had big oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, gee, you know, is there anything here? Because I hadn't heard much about it. In those days, so the Soviets had done a lot of seismic work in various places, but they kept the results of a lot of the seismic stuff. So I know Kazakhstan and Georgia others had frustration because they couldn't get seismic studies, so they couldn't know they really didn't know that much about what mineral resources they had because Moscow tried to keep everything. So Frontera came, and I was I think this is a big deal here in Georgia, but they seemed to think they were, and so you know, they were kind of the first American company really to, to do substantial activity uh, here. But the business climate w was not good. You know, the first investment here, one of the first investments was George Schultz, former Secretary of State, mm -hmm. invested $100,000 in a wine facility here that Shevardnadze had recommended mm -hmm. to him. And well, it was all stolen. Everything was stolen. 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 So... Mm -hmm. Old Soviet men. <laughs> that, so this is before my time. That was when Kent Brown was here. I was yeah. only heard about it later. But that had a sour. I think I remember fight. that that yeah. case. I was not in the ministry, but I, uh, I served in the government. I heard that something like that happened. Mm. It was very unpleasant. Unpleasant. Uh, but country was in chaos. Country was in chaos. chaos. Exactly. That's right. It yeah. was Hedrioni time. <coughs> yes, Hedrioni time. Exactly. Shevardnadze was uh, head of state, but it was sort of semi-formal. So uh, yeah, he was head of state, and you know he was able to neutralize the, the worst warlord fighting and things. But he was he was running a, a coalition enterprise. Yeah. Uh, you know, there were a lot of powerful families and interests around. He couldn't command everything, but he kind of had to manage. Uh, and this made it hard for him to do economic reforms, because yeah. to do economic reforms meant having clear policies, uh, property rights, uh, intellectual property protection, judiciary, judiciary reform, things like that. Um, he. Uh, Private market and democracy, both are chaotic 
from the perspective of somebody who comes from the Soviet world. And they don't trust them. You know, they call it smooth new remedy, the yeah. time of troubles, and all oh, this is this is chaotic and we can't trust it. So Shevardnadze had more exposure to the West as foreign minister, for example, than Gorbachev and understood better, but still didn't have that much. So when he came back, he was able to neutralize warlords, but he didn't have the confidence that Giovanni and others did to, to pull off the hand of the government and allow the market to work and allow democracy to, uh, to work. And because of that, um, corrupt structures were still very powerful, and that made it hard for foreign investors to, uh, to come in. Mm -hmm. So Georgia got off to a slow start in attracting investment. Um, and the whole idea of today, you know, talking about Belt and Road, so that required a lot of political stability before things like Belt and Road can become possible. And now that it is becoming possible, and of course, Georgia has great potential now with ports and uh, transit. And, and the big money is not just transit, the big money is being part of global supply chains, you know, making things, repairing things, and things like that. So Georgia has a huge potential you now to, to do a lot of that uh, here. But it all required stability, and then it required a more attractive investment climate to, uh, to do it. Yes, and many things started changing after 95, mm -hmm. after the mm -hmm. I would say renewal uh, process starting from the elections and so on and so on. But still it was hard because uh, we experienced uh, even uprisings and so on, even assassination later, later in 1998 even. And the, uh, so to talk about corrupt structures, for example, the state bread corporation. So we provided a lot of uh, excess grain. Uh, primarily this is a subsidy to U.S. farmers at home, but as a result of a lot of grain was available. So it would be delivered to the state grain corporation, but there was no mechanism to assure that it was distributed fairly without corruption you know, in Georgia. Mm -hmm. So the state bread corporation during my time was huge, one of the largest sources of corruption. And even later, it, 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 it continued, the, for, for uh, at least for some time. I don't know what about today, but uh, at least I... I don't think today they exist even. Yes, but it was privatized it's, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and now it's, it's completely market yeah, decomposed. Yeah, but that's right, you don't need before it. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, but before that, uh, uh, that time it was one of the largest monsters. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, that's right. And the same in many, 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 many other, many other spheres of economy. Absolutely. One of the Arabs. This is why your insistence on the land reform and everything was so important. And uh, this is why many, many, many people resisted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To have those papers provided to the land uh, landowners. Mm -hmm. Now during. During my time, one of the sort of more difficult challenges was the extent to which Georgian government was focused on Abkhazia and South Ossetia mm -hmm. versus reform. So there was big temptation to to pursue populist politics, if you will, regarding Abkhazia and South Ossetia because of internal anger here about what Russia had done and the yeah. uh, IDPs, the internally displaced persons who, who came out. But in the West, particularly looking for investors, if they saw Georgia was focused mainly on that, then they would think Georgia is not so stable. You know? So our goal was to try to encourage Georgian government to keep the a positive South Ossetian issue in perspective, and fundamentally, um, our view was that the best way Georgia would be able to recover those two areas eventually, someday, 
would be if Georgia was very attractive itself. So economic reform, democratic reform. So the people in those areas would want to be part of Georgia because Georgia was successful. And of course, at that time, Georgia was not seen as successful, so, so it was harder. But you know, we all knew that Georgia was not going to get those back until Georgia was successful and until Russia became a democracy. Uh, Georgia has become more successful, Russia's not a democracy. <laughs> but in the end, one of the more sensitive issues at the time, and, and discussed this only uh, yeah. quietly, was cutting off the railway through a policy of, you know, to Georgia, to, up to uh, Armenia. Our, our discussions with here, we pointed out that if Georgia wanted to get Abkhazia back, there needed to be economic stakeholders in Abkhazia who actually would want to come back and be part of Georgia again. So instead of blocking the railway, you should have open trade so that there were people in Abkhazia who would campaign someday to, for Abkhazia to come back to Georgia because they would see Georgia as a successful country. Um, but that view did not prevail. The more so nationalist sentiment was this. Cut off the railway and you know, punish Abkhazia. Uh, but as a result now, there are, there's nobody in Abkhazia who wants to be part of Georgia again because there are no ties. There's just no, no linkages again. And now we're seeing this play out in Ukraine, where Ukraine has blocked the uh, uh, railway Donbass. connections to the uh, Donbass area. And it, for a long time, it's, it's not going to be helpful for them. And they should learn lessons from Georgia's uh, experience. But the issue is, I seems the issue is still too sensitive here. I mean, political leaders are not advocating opening the railway uh, again. Uh, we learned in trying to isolate Cuba. Turns out that we failed for a half century in isolating Cuba. <laughs> we failed to achieve our objective. Isolation doesn't work. So, uh, but you had, the, I would say, you knew about the existence of the final point of the communist rule there. It was a man mm -hmm. who had to pass away sooner or later. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Here, there is no that such a limiting, limitation factor. Yeah, and there is a Russia who, who is, uh, I take it, strongly uh, keep keeping uh, Abkhazia as a, as, a, as a leverage over, over, over Georgian behavior. And they, as they seem to understand it. I don't think Russia is confident that Abkhazia is always going to be part of Russia. No, no, no. I'm, it's not about that. I think they keep it in, uh, with the aim to prevent Georgia's too fast moving to the West. Yes. They are doing with, yes. with, 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 with the are, Yes, but in addition, they see they have strategic interests yeah. Uh, yeah. in Abkhazia, uh, unlike South Ossetia, but yeah. in Abkhazia. Yeah, Ossetia is another. They could have some naval interests and, yeah. and others. But the Russians have not invested a lot of money in Abkhazia. No, no. no. If, if Russia were confident, that Abkhazia was going to be they theirs. Would it. Yeah. They would invest a lot. It's a tremendous tourism potential. Much, sure, nice, much sure. nicer than such. Yeah, sure. uh, so I think someday when Russia becomes a normal country instead of empire and uh, democracy, uh, there will be new opportunities for Georgia. So the main goal of, of all of us is to promote democracy in Russia? <laughs> well, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, and that was our strategy from the very beginning was we want Russia to become a normal country, uh, to, you know, to respect its neighbors, no sphere of influence, activity. Uh, and so we wanted Russia's neighbors to pursue policies to get along reasonably. So we were always pleased with how Nazarbayev dealt with the Kremlin, uh, because he would make some concessions here and there, and not be a point of confrontation with them. 
Uh, and Shevardnadze was good about that. Uh, Yushchenko and Saakashvili were not so good <laughs> about that. Uh, they had their own strategies. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Mr. Ambassador, you stayed in Georgia for 20, uh, 24 months, from mm -hmm. 1995, September, August uh, 1997. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you left different Georgia in comparison with which what Georgia was when you arrived? Uh, it was different, uh, and my predecessor deserves the credit, uh, Cap Brown, because I arrived in about August '95, maybe September, yeah. and the elections October were October. Mm -hmm. Just right, so so nothing I did contributed. Uh, but what my predecessor did was was very positive. But those elections were really the high point because it, they helped set Georgia on a different course. Uh, it was after those elections that the uh, Europeans began to think harder about Georgia as a European country, for example. Before the elections, nobody really took that seriously. Afterwards, mm -hmm. um, that was the inflection point uh, at which the Europeans began to realize that they had to you know, look at Georgia in a different way and, and make this partnership and cooperation process you know, make this stronger. Uh, process. And of course, you know, we too were very pleased and happy uh, with that. We would have liked for that to have begun a more, a more intensive process of economic reform of the kind that we saw in Poland and, and in the Baltic countries. But it didn't take place. Shevardnadze uh, yeah. didn't know enough about economic reform and was too unwilling to let go. And then you have these large state enterprises around here mm -hmm. which wanted subsidies uh, and they you know, bled the, the treasury yeah. uh, too much. And they should have been privatized, but it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Although uh, we were talking yesterday, in 1996 uh, and 97, It was highest rate of uh, GDP growth, growth. Mm -hmm. double GDP mm -hmm. digit, mm -hmm. just once in our history, mm -hmm. double digit uh, growth rate uh, mm -hmm. uh, in 1996 and 1997. It was the really reflection of all the efforts before election, the election, mm -hmm. and new enthusiasm, and, and many things, mm -hmm. many things happened there. That's why I, I called uh, that time very fascinating because it was fast moving forward. And unfortunately then it, 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 it did not, it, we failed to cap that path, that uh, strength of uh, economic development. It's a reform is like riding a bicycle. Uh -huh. If you stop moving ahead, yeah, sure. uh, it fall off. Uh, and so, you know, plus the 1998 Russia crisis, uh, 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 because we depended. Yeah. Now we yeah. depend less on Russian yes. uh, developments. Yes. Yes. At that time, we fully, uh, yeah. no, because it was mm -hmm. huge, huge uh, yeah. importer of our goods and everything. Mm -hmm. Economically, they tried to hit it, uh, Georgian financial system badly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And since that started, plus a uh, big support for Georgian economy was always remittance money, mm -hmm. mainly coming from Russia. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as soon as crisis was there, mm -hmm. our citizens working in Russia were not able anymore to send money back to Georgia. So it and it was also decreased. Yeah. It decreased. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, worsened pavement balance, uh, mm -hmm. a stroke, uh, lorry, and uh, so it was it was difficult also for Georgia to survive. Mm -hmm. 1998 was difficult. But those previous years, economically, I remember Mr. Chirac once joked uh, when he met Shevardnadze, I suppose it was in Madrid, 97 or something, there, when Shevardnadze 
explain, talk to him, tell, told him that what is going on in Georgia, and he mentioned it. We had the 12% uh, growth last year. <laughs> he joked that, please, <laughs> give us just one digit for one year. <laughs> One digit for one year because so it was a really, really amazing uh, moving. Georgia's economy is more flexible than the econ most of the economies of the European Union of which you want to be a part. So it's important. It was important then, and still important for Georgia's economy to remain flexible. They have very high youth unemployment in many European countries because of labor market restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, Georgia Georgia needs to go faster than the European Union countries on average Absolutely. in sure. order to get up into the range to join European Absolutely. European uh, We Union. spoke about it yesterday also. Yeah. Unfortunately latest dynamics is not in favor of Georgia in this respect because comparing with the poorest EU member countries, mm -hmm. Bulgaria mm -hmm. and Romania for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. Uh, GDP per capita growth is not impressive, so mm -hmm. we need much, much, yeah. bad, much better, yeah. much better growth. Yeah, and I think it will, hap it will happen. Your economy and Russia's economy too, and we're just more flexible. We don't have a lot built in. So, for example, with oil price drop and sanctions, GDP in Russia has not fallen as much as we expected. It, it fell by uh, uh, several percentage points, but the econ economy adapted. Your, your economy is able to adapt uh, pretty well. Uh, and then because you get along with everybody, because churches get along with everybody, uh, you have these big conferences like Belt and Road, Batumi is now becoming uh, yeah. kind of, uh, well, you know, how to compare Batumi. But you know, you have Iranians, you have Turks, you have Russians, you have other people. And it's a true international flavor. This is a big comparative advantage for Absolutely. for Georgia, and always was because Georgia always was able to contribute. Yeah, this year the Saba, the uh, tourism industry boosted enormously. Mm -hmm. It was felt by by physically I would say, mm -hmm. presence of uh, yeah. foreign tourists here in Tbilisi and everywhere mm -hmm. in Kakheti, in in Svanet, in. In the, in the remote areas, even in the mountains. Absolutely, yeah. mm -hmm. absolutely. It has real impact on Georgian economy now. Mm -hmm. Kazbegi was overcrowded the entire, entire, not just even, even now. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. are many, many, many uh, visitors. Mm -hmm. Yes. All hotel there been oh. overcrowded during this. So this season showed that there's a potential. It has to be, I would say. Organized better, many, many, many services are needed in addition. Many, many, I would say, many respects. Well, lo low cost air flights in Europe have been a boon for Georgia. The Ryanair, EasyJet, things like that. But there are, business. there is a um, uh, visa air. There is a visa uh, based in Kutaisi uh, Airport. Uh, they, that they fly from Kutaisi almost mm -hmm. every, every city. In Europe, yeah, they they have uh, extensively covered, particularly yeah. the European European de destinations. But Tbilisi Airport uh, hub should be, I would say, somehow resettled. It's something mm -hmm. yeah. not that convenient. We need. Yeah, I re remember when I first came here. The, the Chevron Arts, that's oh, actually. You remember a part of that? <laughs> well, I do remember. So, remember Sakharov mm -hmm. had called Georgia a little empire? Uh -huh. Yeah, Sakharov. Yeah. Azer yeah. Azeris, Armenians, yeah. Muscatian Turks, Chechens, you know, everybody. And so, from the very beginning, uh, you know, certainly Chevron Arts had the understanding that you know, Georgia was only going to succeed if, if they could keep everybody you know, reasonably yeah. within the boundary. Uh, and that has not always been easy, particularly you know, we were concerned at the time that that uh, moving everything to Georgian language and not disadvantage the Azeris and Armenians, for mm -hmm. example, and, and others. Uh, but Georgia 
managed that pretty well, you know, during my time, managed that pretty well, still seems to have, uh, have done that. Uh, that too is a strength that uh, actually is a, a model for some European countries that are having more difficulties uh, in that way. So it's another big strength of Georgia. Yes, I would agree. And uh, Bill, would you agree that it was, of course, Shavanati's job, not only, but no, he, was, he was leading that process. Georgia, your tenure time, those mm-hmm. years when uh, the Karabakh conflict, uh, not settled, but they mm-hmm. reached the ceasefire and finally some, some, some developments uh, started taking place. Uh, these oil and gas projects mm-hmm. are coming from that development, otherwise mm-hmm. it would be uh, impossible even for Aliyev to mm-hmm. get any, any investor. But what Georgia did at that time mm, uh, was uh, that a sort of balance was established, normal relationship with both of them, mm-hmm. keeping at the same time neutrality in their uh, mm-hmm. work, uh, struggle, not to intervene, uh, not taking on uh, any function of uh, mitigation and so on, it's not our job, but uh, providing both of them with services at maximum, we put, mm-hmm. and explaining to the re- leaders of, uh, of both sides why we are doing uh, and working with their, their adversaries. Mm-hmm. And they, they got it. They both understood that it was inevitable, mm-hmm. and I think this that that was really a successful, I would say, job, uh, which uh, had established that kind of balance which still exists here mm-hmm. in, in the Caucasus. Definitely, it's not it's, it's a, so something which uh, will end sooner or later because it is based on the Karabakh. Mm-hmm. Problem, mm-hmm. but uh, but still, as of today, this is this I would say sort of approach keeps uh, keeps keeps the main main processes in the South Caucasus. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, would you agree with this? Oh well, yes, no, no, I know. So at the time, of course, international conferences could be held here. But not in Yerevan or yeah, Iraq yeah. or because of no way to do things like that. Armenia, as you know, has diaspora in Europe, a lot in Paris, in the US, yeah, a lot sure. in uh, Southern California, for example. Mm-hmm. So when we were talking about the oil and other routes to the west and the Baku Tbilisi Chehan pipeline, so of course the Gia from a topographical standpoint. It was a better way, yeah. Through Armenia, it's a better yes. way. Sure. Um, I remember just that, wasn't that going that to conversation. And so, no we, talks. And so, you know, we, we weren't really sure was well, the Armenian diaspora in California going to put pressure on Congress, the US president, you know, not to allow things to go around Armenia. Um, but Georgia proceeded very carefully it never gave the impression that it was trying to exploit its advantage relative to yeah, sure. Armenia. Um, it was quietly cooperative. And so these arrangements, including now most recently the, the Baku Cars, right, yeah. cars Railway. Baku uh, Cars. Yeah, yeah. From Galaki to Cars, this right. connection. Right, yeah. Uh, so at, the, at that time we, you know, we didn't know exactly how this was going to work, but Georgia managed it quite well. Good. Well, unless Mr. Ambassador wants to add something. <laughs> so I have a uh, well, let me ask just a couple of things. A couple of things. Uh, yeah, we've covered most of it. One was painful. Um, the Georgian diplomat in Washington had an automobile accident. Giga Maharadze. Yes. His name was. And so uh, that was on Saturday night. So Sunday afternoon, I went in to see Chef and 
Chevron attitude right away was understood that his diplomatic immunity had to be lifted yeah. to solve that issue. Uh, and that was that was very helpful uh, mm -hmm. in the context. So it was, you know, Trevor Manton knew what the right thing was to do. That was a little bit unprecedented, but the circumstances of the accident were, were uh, such that... We'll be a little uh, criticized by colleagues yes. from yeah. other countries. <laughs> what yes. I'm doing? No. So we did cover a lot. Oh, yes. First time I went to Abhazia, I had dinner alone with our Zimba. And at one point he said, you know, the Georgians can sing and dance, but they can't fight. That was his perspective. Mm -hmm. But of course, he had, you know, Shamil Basayev and the Russians all helping, helping him. Uh, we talked about assassination attempts. I, most of the security procedures you need to reduce risks are simple procedures. Um, as diplomats, we are all trained in them. Most important is vary the times and routes you take to go to work. Go different times, go different ways. Uh, I talked with Chevron now, I said, <laughs> multiple times, asked him. Yeah, he worked till 10 o'clock at night, and then he went home the same way. It was just impossible, impossible to protect. Then you know, we had some specialists to try to help him with security. And one of the basic elements for automobile security is to have an envelope of security that's larger. Yeah. So um, you have people who go out in front, and a, a block or two ahead, and look to see if anything is unusual. Well, the second time, I remember, he went on the street where all the street lights are out, and just went, but it was his normal route home, and then the, you know, they fired uh, R RPG remote. RPG, 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 RPG yeah. And it hit the engine block of his car, yeah. and he was just so lucky. But if he had had this wider security envelope, they would have radioed back to the car that all those street lights are out on this block, so maybe something was wrong. But he wouldn't do that, and so they just had to, uh, just had a narrow envelope. Uh, let's see. You know, Trevor Nazi and Elton. two of the few post-Soviet leaders at that time who did not try to become massively rich. To another end? And Yeltsin. Yeltsin. Neither of them, you know, they, they had family members who you know, tried to take advantage of the situation. But Chevronazi and Yeltsin, neither was personally so as a yeah. top goal to become wealthy. You know who the other people are. But we always admired both Chevronazzi and Yeltsin for really fundamentally focused on their public duties, uh, even though they both had families that, that tried to uh, take advantage of the situation. I tried to encourage Chevronazzi to, to allow his government to work more on its own Remember in the Soviet Union, the practice was the leader of an opcom or a republic or whatever would have these televised meetings and government ministers or officials would sit below the table and the leader would you know, say, you know, you've got to you know, make the electricity work more the power often. To uh, the <laughs> right. Threat, so yeah. it was all, you know, the Tsar and the Boyers and the Boyers were all but making mistakes. I tried to encourage him to pull back from that and, and allow the ministers and others to have a little more independent. But he didn't, you know, that was not part of his experience. He had had so much experience before, so he kept, he kept working in that way. At the very end of my time, uh, 
Senator John McCain, uh, Senator K. Bailey Hutchison, mm -hmm. and Senator Phil Graham came here. Uh, it was just after Chevy Nancy's visit to Washington yeah, I remember in that. July 1997. And then that visit too. Okay, okay. Um, and at one point in the meeting, because there had been some elections after that 95, there had been some other elections that had been less honest. And so at one point, McCain, who is unusually direct sometimes, he said, you know, my colleagues and I, we have to run in honest elections to be elected to the United States Senate. You know, it's really important for you to you know, understand how much importance we attach to, uh, to honest mm -hmm. elections. I was afraid Shelby Nancy would be insulted by it, uh, but McCain is, you know, is quite, quite direct. Okay, now well, those are, we've covered, we've covered every, yes, we covered it, all the points. Uh, yeah. So, we, uh, I have to repeat, we have a bunch of yes, prepared in this meeting, we talk on many, many issues, but I hope very much that we will be given a chance to talk maybe in the, sure. in the future also sure. on the current development, on what Georgia uh, should do to be more effectively, I would say, moving forward and many, many other things. Uh, thank you very much. Sure, thank you. It was Appreciate really it. an honor best. to be asked. Yes. Uh, really, uh, the honor for us to, 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 to be with you here, and I think it will be very helpful for us yes. in our research and in our work to, 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 to I would say, really describe what was going on uh, objectively. We did not talk about your diplomatic training activities, but when you look look back now, a disproportionate share of Georgians who have ended up in leadership positions or other things have had come out of the diplomatic training, the diplomatic uh, process. Yes, it's another <laughs> it's, uh, it's sensitive so, for me. Well, you have. You worked hard on this, and the high quality of the diplomatic corps in Georgia is something that, that we used to discuss quite a lot. We, we, we held up the Georgian diplomatic corps as kind of a model of what can be achieved uh -huh. uh, in, in other areas. Uh, you had so many people who spoke English. I remember even when I was here and I would talk with groups of young Georgians, I said, some of you should study Russian because Russian is always going to be your neighbor, big neighbor here. But oh, young Georgians all wanted to study English uh, at the time. And now I find here, you know, just walking, I was walking along Rista Valley and uh, talking with some people here and there. And Young people don't speak Russian. Uh, uh, many of yeah, it's, it's it's getting a problem for us. Mm -hmm. Not problem, but uh, would be would be better if uh, these trilingual, I would say, trilingual Georgian, because uh, Russian is not uh, only Russian or uh, way to communicate with Russians. We have many other neighbors. Neighbor, yes. Yeah. To, 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 to talk to and uh, I don't think that uh, Georgians will be able to study Abkhaz that actively mm -hmm. anytime soon mm -hmm. and the communications with others with, with, with our, our core citizens although, although now, uh, living out of our legal space it also requires Russian Maybe. So you're absolutely right that that advice is, is valid. 
Let me mention one other thing. Um, through my work at RAND, we have a program with private sector business leaders in Russia uh -huh. and U.S. and European business leaders, and I kind of shepherd mm -hmm. that, that program. So this is people you know, like Victor Vexelberg and Alexei Mordashov, uh -huh. and Lisa, and people yeah. like that. You know, they all see themselves as European and global business leaders, just like any other European business leader. Now they and other Russians are beginning to worry that Georgia, Ukraine, and even Belarus now, as well as Baltics, are going to create a wall of Europe that's going to exclude Russia. Do educated urban elites in Russia want to be part? They, when you talk to them at cocktail parties, mm -hmm. they envy the visa-free travel that you and Ukraine and Moldova have. Uh, uh, they don't want to be left behind. So on one hand, they still have an so imperial mind, mindset, you know, Nash, and stuff like that. But on the other hand, you know, they see their culture as European. You know, Tolstoy and others are great, you know, ballet, you know, they see themselves as Europeans. They don't see themselves as Alexander Dugan-like Eurasianists you know, in some middle land. But they are concerned that you, Ukraine, and now they're very worried about Lukashenko and Belarus. They see Belarus. Some Russians now believe Belarus is lost. Um, it's not, we have, don't see it on the outward side, but a lot of changes are yeah. happening in Belarus. And so that's the last... More or less than, than the... Uh, it's the last building block, if you will. The Baltics, you know, around. So, so as you go to Europe, We in the West will want you to do what Poland has done for Ukraine, what Germany did first for Poland, and then Poland was done for Ukraine, to help lift up. So we will want you to help lift up Russia and help it go to Europe. Now this is the, the future. This is not right now. Uh, Nobody wants to be at the eastern edge of civilization. German, West Germany did not want to be exposed. When Germany unified, it did not want to be exposed. When Poland became independent, or became free, did not want to be exposed. Uh, and now the Russians are scared to death that they're going to be left. But they are isolating themselves. Oh, no. It is no. their own job. No one is, uh, no. you know, no. No. the entire world. Never, never, never push away from the I sincere, I'm from so sincerely that. believing yeah. that it is in the world's uh, interest to have uh, Russia engaged, I would say, engaged and, yeah. uh, I would say, uh, got into all businesses. Mm -hmm. They are doing the, themselves this mm -hmm. such a such a nasty thing. Things. Mm -hmm. This uh, event with uh, Olympics, it's just because they terribly, terribly, I would say, nastily um, uh, reacted on the criticism yes. and nothing else. So after the scandal broke, what did Putin do? Yeah, promote promote Mutko to, to be yeah. deputy prime minister. It's as though he went to the Olympic Committee yeah. and said this, yeah. you know, to the Olympic Committee. But it's, it's there, it's the uh, shoot down of the MH17 airplane, mm -hmm. it's denying their forces are in the Donbass area. Uh, it's just one place after another, they're not telling the truth, and they're just trying to stiff. So, to my mind, uh, I was in Moscow in the Brezhnev drop-off time. Mm -hmm. Just too many problems trying to push too hard, including then in Afghanistan and 
and the correlation of forces, the Sankashani seal just moved against against them, and they didn't adapt fast enough. And by the time Gorbachev came to power, it was too late. They just couldn't adapt fast enough. But you have the Georgians have the maturity, the experience, the deeper Western understanding. So it may sound strange now, but the time is going to come when we're going to look to you to, to help Russia. Russia will have to become a normal country first. I agree, I agree, I agree, yeah. absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The key point in this part of the world is Russia's uh, transformation. Yes. Okay. How it happens, I don't know. When it happens. When it happens, uh, would it be possible for Georgia to anyway uh, influence the uh, process that they I don't know, but absolutely, without changing minds of Russians, nothing, nothing, nothing. Yes. Maybe we are in a way also contributing even at the moment. I mean this one million Russian tourists coming to Georgia and they're yes. going back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So exactly. they're bringing of back course. another experience yes. about Georgia. Exactly. They're a sort of our advocates because with all this brainwashing machine, yes. it's, it's impossible to influence them because they have witnessed themselves what is Georgia, yeah. that Georgia is a friendly country, there is no... Uh, no one, uh, no one is killing no Russians, one is killing and Russians. And everybody, so whatever they can, they're demonstrating their hospitality and so on. It's <coughs> so I think that it's also from not only economically but politically very important. Yes. This is our soft power. Our yes, soft which is soft power. power. This That's is real, real, real soft power. power. Exactly. Right. exactly. Yeah. Soft power is not just uh, uh, propaganda and so on. This is the, I would say, what to. The soft what power show. Is, the, is the ability to attract. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what, that's what absolutely. we have. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much.